Um, to so you know, hello everyone. Uh, you know, my name is uh, Dan Figatner. I'm the chair of the CTBUH Chicago Future Leaders Committee. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to the uh, Jewel Changi Airport presentation by Bureau Happold, who served as the uh, structural engineer and facade engineers for the project. Um, first off, if I can get the slide, uh, I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everyone on this Zoom will be muted with their video off. Uh, for the duration of the presentation. Uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, so please type your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, I believe at the bottom of the screen. Um, we will not be using the chat function uh, for that. And next slide. So a little bit about CTBUH. Uh, we were founded in 1969. We're a nonprofit, multidisciplinary worldwide association focused on tall buildings and sustainable cities. <clears throat> As of 2020, the CTBUH organizational member network included over 2 million individuals working in over 10,000 offices around the world. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters for tonight. First off is uh, Cristobal Correa. He's a principal at Bureau Happold's New York City office with over 20 years of experience. Uh, throughout his career, he's been at the forefront of innovative design and structural engineering. Uh, Cristobal has led the design of tension structures, facades, art installations, long span structures, stadiums, and temporary buildings, as well as more traditional buildings of concrete and steel. <coughs> In the process, he's acquired uh, experience working collaboratively with architects building in Europe, Latin America, Asia, Middle East, and the United States. Um, our other presenter will be Carly Bast. She's a graduate structural engineer at Bureau Happel, who's interested in unique structures with strong solutions. She believes that brilliance is achieved through interdisciplinary collaboration between structures and architecture. As a two-year participant in the International Shell Conference, Carly has spoken on structurally optimized solutions in long-span structures. Carly's education not only features a background in classical structural engineering, but has also studied topics such as multi-objective optimizations in the building world and topology optimization. So with that, I'll throw it over to them uh, to start the presentation. Cristobal, you're muted. There you go. Hi, thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, Dan. Thanks again for that that, that uh, introduction. We're really happy to be here with uh, with you guys today, um, and I'm really excited to be presenting with Carly. You know, usually usually I only get to present by myself, but I don't get like uh, young, brilliant people to present with. So I'm very I'm very excited to be here with Carly today. We're we're actually working on projects even as we speak. Um, but what we're going to be doing today is we're gonna be talking about um, a project that I worked on, uh, which is Singapore Changi Airport, which is gonna be the main uh, topic today. But then um, Carly's gonna be talking about uh, grid shells in general, because uh, Changi Airport is a grid shell. And she's specifically gonna be talking about embodied carbon um, and features of other grid shells that, so that we'll be able to take something that is very specific, which is the project at Changi Airport. And then we're gonna be able to move it into sort of a general discussion about our role as engineers and you know what we're do what we're doing um, in these in these days, and we're going to follow that by a Q by a Q and A um, a Q and A to be able to answer some of your questions. So I'm going to be speaking for about a half an hour. I think Carly for about 15 minutes, and then we'll probably have 15 minutes of of Q and A. Great. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Ch uh, Changi, Joel Changi, and I like to talk. I like to um, think about this project in terms of its complexity and in terms of how, how we deal with complexity as, as designers and sort of multi, multifaceted aspects of things. It's just some housekeeping. So um, what I like to do um, when I talk about this project is I often show the video that was used as a presentation um, for a company, because it, it started life off as a competition entry. So I'm just gonna play this. Um, you buy the heavy clear for departure. Yes, yeah, start on our final descent to Singapore's, like Singapore's Changi Airport. Current weather is 28 degrees Celsius with clear skies. Uh, Singapore Changi Airport is a very large airport in Ready 
First of all, would you mind turning the, vid uh, the video volume down a little bit? It's hard to hear you. A little, a little bit more. I'm going to go back to the, to the, uh, there we go. So that was a competition entry. And when you go back to this idea of complexity, Right, I always think about, well, what is complexity in a project like this? And so there's a complexity of the form, which you, you guys could see, complexity of the use in terms of what the project was gonna be used for. Um, and then in terms of the functions, the things that are going on inside, inside the space. So these are just images of actual built projects from other architects that are contem completely contemporary. So you can see that Joule is not something that is so odd. There's a lot of complexity currently going on in, in sort of in architecture and building. So how does this complexity change the way that we need to design as engineers? Um, I think it's really fundamental that we be able to sort of look beyond what we typically do and understand what everyone else is doing in terms of sort of our integration. Um, and this extends also into how our projects were built and how pieces of things will be fabricated because all that obviously goes back into how you design something because you can't really design something well if you don't understand how it's built. Um, which we've always we've all known that and engineering actually comes from building so we've kind of lost that connection um in the you know hundreds of years that engineers have existed but it's always been there right the connection back to how is how things are built complexity creates a lot of data um you know these buildings are very complicated they have complicated geometries there's there's a lot there's a lot going on and all this has to be kind of put together and i think the last point is the most important which is basically we have to figure out how to take this data and synthesize it in such a way that it helps us make decisions because we have to make decisions about what things are going to look like and what and where we're going to go. So this is just an image of the of the project. Again, this is from the competition. Um, and then here, this is the actual build project. Um, the building opened in 2019, so it's a couple of it's a couple of years old. Um, and you can see these are the images from the inside. So you can it's kind of surprising that how similar it is actually to what is actually built. You can see the airport train. Uh, running here in the background. Oops, I think my cursor, anyway. You can, see the air, you can see the airport train there, but you can see the people. All right, so the first thing that we looked at, if you think about this issue of complexity was the actual shape of the building, right? It's a non-symmetrical form, it's an ovoid. The oculus is offset because of the airport train that was running through the, through the site. What, what we were doing in, as part of our work was we were basically designing what you, what we're, what you can see here that is in red, which is basically the, the, um, the roof as well as the facades on the sides of the building. The, the part that's in blue is a, is, a, is a relatively traditional, as much as tradition, traditional as you could say. It's a, um, a concrete on metal deck uh, building with five stories of, of parking. Um, and so if you look at the, at the roof in plan, you can see there's a series of columns or support along the perimeter, and you can see the ovoid shape pretty clearly, and you can see also the oculus. So if, if you look at this project and think about it, it's like, okay, well, what is this, how, what are the objectives of this project? Well, obviously it needs to stand up, and we all know how to do that. We're, we're, there's a structural challenge here, but it's a, it's a grid shell, so we have to be able to design that. But it also has to look good. The, the structure and the architecture are the same, right? So you can't really separate them out. They're the same item. So immediately there's a whole bunch of questions that appear in terms of like, how should we define the shape, right? And how, where should we put structure? How should we break down the, the how, how should we break down the geometry? What's the best size of things? How do we put things together? And a lot of these questions are not just structural questions, right? There are also questions that have to do with fabrication and with procurement. Um, so what we were doing as the engineer here was we, this is a had a had a design assist procurement. What we were doing is what we were, what I call sort of the Goldilocks uh, Goldilocks problem, which is basically we were creating information that could be bid on as a tender set that would be it had to be precise enough that whatever whatever was bid out to a bunch of contractors would be would give the client and the architect what they wanted, but at the same time it shouldn't be so precise that you couldn't. You couldn't let the contractor come up with great ideas to save money because we're not builders anymore we're more engineers we don't understand a lot of the things that the builder has to do so we want to give them the freedom to be actually to be able to make the design better 
So we have to kind of leave leave room for the for the contractor while at the same shot time ensuring that we get the best possible price. We have to leave, we have to give them a little bit of leeway. So in terms of who we work with, so this project was done with Moshe Safdie and Associates out of Boston. They have a pretty big presence in Singapore. Um, and then there's a the developer, the main contractor. I, I put in bold kind of our principal the principal people for us, which is the architect, and then the contractor. <coughs> excuse me. Marrow Structures, who won this project after they responded to the tender. And then we have the local, the local engineer and architect. So we produce what you typically produce in a project, right? We produce drawings and specifications for structural and facade components like you would do on every other project. But we also did, which was really important in this project, is we produced a whole series of technical memos that, uh, that basically addressed issues around logistics, constructability, and fabrication. I'm going to talk about some of these things. But this information was created and then given to the contractors so that they actually were as knowledgeable as we could make them. So that they could they could actually bid this as precisely as they could, and to remove risk, the perception of risk, which is usually related to the perception of unknown. So we actually studied the problems very well, and then we explained it to them. So some of the design drivers that we had is we have a panelization driver, right, which relates to how you manufacture facades and glass. There's issues around discretization, which is about where to put steel. There's a structural analysis optimization, which is coming from a form, and then there's all these issues around detailing and fabrication. So you've all seen charts like this that talk about how you know the architect gives the engineer a shape, the, the engineer breaks it down, the engineer does a bunch of work on it, eventually ends up with a rhino model, right? And it's all kind of nice and smooth. The reality is really it's something more like this, right? Because what happens is you start to do some work and then you realize that something else is happening and then this changes and that changes. So it's really, it's really a kind of one step forward, one step back. It's more like a dance really where you're trying to find the right solution. And so the tools for communicate, communicating with the design team are super important. These are, these are Rhino models that we created as we were kind of running our structural analysis to help render the structure and to help the architect, engineer, the architect understand what the building looked like. And these were super important so that the client could understand what the spaces would feel like. Um, in terms of the, the roof itself, a bunch of components, you know, com compression rings over columns, an inner shell that is, that is basically the intention, an outer, outer shell that's in compression. Um, the models themselves, right? Uh, 25,000 square meter of area, over 5,000 nodes, 13,000 panels. So, I mean, these, this is things that we can do now because we have really great software to analyze this sort of stuff. Um, the other thing that I'm just gonna show you some images from the structural analysis, but one of the things that's interesting here is if you look at the patterning of the dome, You'll see in the structural analysis, you see it's got a bunch of X's in it or crosses. And if you look here, it's just the series of triangles. And this actually shows the development because our initial models, right, had discretizations that didn't necessarily align with what was going to be used, um, which would ended up being used. So this is also part of the process. So these are these are sort of like sort of um, we define the hoops as the elements that were going in sort of lines of lines of latitude around the dome. And here you can see the dead and live loaded that it show areas of compression and tension areas of moment around columns. Those of you who are structural engineers will recognize some of these things. Uh, you can see the radial axial loads um, and more the, the moment over the, again, the, the positive moments over the columns that, that show where you're gonna need to have um, structural depth. And then finally, the, the deflections, which were not that surprising because we knew that the, the inside would deflect more because it's not being held by the columns. Um, and then there was a little area of deflection on, in the, on the other side too, where the shell length was a little bit bigger, which, um, which we obviously were concerned about. We did some preliminary sizing right here. You can see this is all in metric. So you can see that the, that the sort of the, the biggest elements are right over the columns, right? Where you had those, those negative moments. You can see you had 650 deep member. Um, in the middle where everything is in tension, you, and there's no buckling issue, right? You can see that you can get very, very thin. So you could, you could see that it was kind of like the, the it was like an onion, really, like you were peeling back these layers and we could kind of understand it in that way. So we did a bunch of form finding related to structural optimization. There you can see again that area where we had deflection. So we thought about, well, how do we fix that? And what we came up with is like, okay, well, we're going to form find it. We're going to kind of inflate the structure a little bit to kind of create, to create more shell action. So the, the initial shape that we got from the architect, we started to modify it and play with it, always making sure, of course, that this could work, would work with what they were doing. We have our original shape there that we got from the architects. We started to optimize it by creating more arch action. We even thought about raising it, right? Um, and make, making the, make, giving it kind of a bump out. The architect quite liked the idea, 
Unfortunately, the airport didn't because it turned out that there was a rate, there was an issue with bouncing radar and we weren't able to actually actually do that. But it just kind of shows how, you know, how the shape was actually influenced by so many things. Um, an interesting thing about a warped surface like this, right, is that you have to cloud it. And as engineers, we don't typically worry about topology, but if you work in facades and clouding systems, you need to understand that in order to cloud something, you need to figure out how it's how it's going, how you're going to put the pieces together. So any you can cloud anything with triangles, right? Because a triangle has three points and you know that you can put a flat piece of something there. So triangular triangular geometries were a good, you can look at that. But you know, we were interested in saving money and coming up with something original. So we also looked at uh, quadrilateral panels. Because you can you can cloud something with quadrilateral panels with the condition that you allow for an offset, right? Where the panels come together. And so here you can see that there's an offset. The advantage of a quadrilateral panel is that you wait, there's less wastage because it's square rather than triangular. Um, we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But then also um, you can make the panels bigger and possibly save money that way as well. Um, this, we did this on a project that I think Carly's going to talk briefly about at the Smithsonian Gallery in Washington, where this is actually clad with black cows. And you can see that the glazing detail allows for that kind of offset. In the end, we went back to triangles. But these are, again, these are some of the studies that we did. We also looked at discretization, which is, I like to say, that's the way that the sort of the pattern like is on the, uh, on, the, um, on the dome. And you can see here that we looked at a bunch of different, a bunch of different patterns. Um, and we were concerned in terms of how they looked. And then also the density, right? Is it better to have very large triangles and large pieces of glass and the, and the steel is bigger? Or is it better to have small pieces of glass and, and smaller elements? Um, but then you have more nodes. So there's a, there's a cost analysis there. In schematic design, we, and, and you saw this uh, structural model, we had more Xs. And then in design, in DD, we ended up with, uh, with panels that are more triangulated. Um, another interesting problem with it specific to this project is if you start off with a certain layout of triangles on the outside and you work yourself in, eventually the triangles get smaller and smaller and smaller and they become, they don't work anymore, right? Your glass panels get too small. So we had to think about pruning. How were we going to prune this? Um, and, and how does that influence the structural behavior? So again, an, another study to understand like what the best way to do this is and what the behavior, how it might impact the behavior. Um, I think it's really interesting also to look at something that as a structural engineer, I never really thought about, which is like, you know, glass, pieces of glass and what, what's the right size for a piece of glass. It turns out that if you use a laminated glass, right, the laminated glass ovens are typically 2.5 meters in, in width. And so anything bigger than that, you're in the supersizing and it's a lot more money. So we, we use this as a condition to make sure that we would, we would not never have anything bigger than 2.5 meters um, as a piece of glass. Um, we were also interested in reducing the numbers of pieces of glass that were different. So we started to look at the, the detail that was created um, with the way that the glass connected to the steel and thinking about the tolerance that's there, because maybe you could use different, different geometries could be accommodated in the same piece of glass. So we did. A, we actually hired a mathematician, or we didn't hire him. He actually worked for us in one of our offices. But they looked at this problem: how do you how do you sort of group um, pieces of glass so that you can use the same piece of glass multiple places? In the end, it didn't matter because we ended up because because of computer fabrication. Now it doesn't really matter that all the pieces of glass are different sizes. But this was something that we wanted to understand, and we wanted to also share with the um, with the contractors who were bidding on this. We looked also at how you would pack these, right? Because glass typically comes in 3.2 by six meter sheets. So how do you pack triangles in a sheet and what kind of wastage do you have? So we did a bunch of studies to understand what kind of wastage there was. And again, we gave that information to the contractor that we're bidding so that they would understand how much wastage they might have. The steel sections are interesting. We, we talked about how we have different depths, but then what should they be, right? There's all sorts of sizes and ideas about what this the section should look like in terms of making it look slender. And then in terms of economics, right? You want a rolled section um, has a uniform thickness, may not be the most efficient thing when you have bending, um, but might be cheaper. Um, and then, you know, it doesn't have the crisp corners that the built-ups like, that the architect wanted. The architect actually was interested in, in a built-up tapered section because they really liked the idea that the section would get smaller and look more, more elegant. Um, in the end, we ended up with uh, with the built ups, and then here you can see at the compression when you have the very large elements, you can see the sizes um, the, as they get deeper. So this was part of the information that was given to the contractor, right? We gave them a map that showed them where we would need different sizes, 
so that it was pretty specific. And here you can see this is actually from the build project. You can see um, kind of the layout of the elements. Just some other shots that were done during construction. And now probably the, one of the most interesting things about this project are the nodes, right? So these are these are the, our drawings that were used um, in our tender set um, to kind of think about how you might make these. Um, this is a typical node. Um, it's not immediately apparent that you haven't done one of these projects before, but there's a lot of geometrical variation that happens as a, at a node. We, we actually say that there's three angles. There's the angle between two elements in, in the plane of the dome. There's an angle that is with respect to the sort of the, the normal of the dome, and then there's a twist that happens. And so we have an alpha, beta, gamma that you can see here. And what that does is it defines kind of the geometry of the node because what, what will happen is that you'll get these little offsets. And it was very important to the architect that you not read the offset. They wanted you to read this and it's actually quite successful. You don't see this project as a series of elements that are connected by nodes. You just see it as a continuous surface and you don't distinguish the node. And that, that was really important to limit, to limit that might look like. Again, we did a series of studies. We said, well, maybe we cast these nodes and we use the same nodes for multiple locations, allowing a certain amount of variance. And these are studies that kind of showed, well, what might, might this look like? The, the, the image on the right doesn't look very good, right? Because you can see that there's a big, there's a big offset. But we did the same thing. We tried to group things into families to try to understand, you know, how we might save money if we were able to do replicating castings. We also like, you know, we we when we were talking about this to the contractors because we were explaining what was going on here, we we did 3D printing of, um, you know, these 3D printers now you can just have them in your office and run and run 3D prints because we wanted to explain what was happening, right? And we took these to the, to the workshops that we had with the contractors. The contractors came back and told us how they were planning on building the nodes, which is really interesting because they use their own knowledge to show us the best way to do things. So all these, all these elements, right? You can see here that there's a whole vocabulary of elements and pieces that are coming together in terms of how you make this geometry. It's kind of like it's a system, right? And so it was very important to us to kind of explain again, to, to remove kind of this feeling of, this problem being very difficult and this project being very complicated, to look at this as in a parametric way, in that, that you could define all these elements and you could define them all, that they were all gonna be controlled by a relationship that existed between certain points. So if you look at it that way, you can create a parametric system with everything, with the gaskets, with the piece of glass, with the node, with the element, and you can kind of, you can kind of indicate really that this is the same, it's all the same, whether you're at the base, in the middle or at the top, that basically it's the same series of elements that are being created. And you can basically generate the geometries of all the different pieces um, based on a series of rules. So that actually the description of this, this description of this project is actually a lot simpler than you might than you might imagine. And I think what this does is it kind of takes away a lot of the a lot of the people can kind of look at this and say, okay, yeah, I understand. I understand how I would do this. So it's very, very useful exercise for us. And this, 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 of course, we shared with the contractor. I want to show some construction shots. So we also, as part of, and I think all engineers do this, as part of what we were, we wanted to show too, is how you would actually build this, right? So we had to, even though we're not contractors, right? We have to have a, a reasonable way that we can show them, well, this might be the way that you might build this if you had one crew, if you had two crew. And so we would we we use what we know to sort of explain how we thought that might be the best way to do this. We also made sure that they built mock-ups so that we could make choices, informed choices about what things would look like. Here you can see one of the nodes, and you can see these um, these sort of offsets that I was describing earlier. We also did testing of these mock-ups, right? These are typically tested with for water penetration and stuff like that um, to understand how they were how they were behaving and to sort of make the make them work better. Um, there's some, these movies are quite short. The thing that you do for the, with a mock-up to understand. Um, you test the glass as well, right? The, the glass makeups to make sure that they're going to work. Um, and then there's a, there was a lot of complexity in terms of the geometry of this. And we had a, an amazing steel shop and uh, fabricator in Singapore who built a lot of these warped sections. Um, you can see here the, the steel shop and they just built these on jigs. Pretty amazing. The, the nodes in the end were all individual. They were all different. They were built from rolling stock. I don't have any images of how they're made because unfortunately it's a proprietary secret. Uh, so I wasn't able to actually see the machines that, I saw the machines that milled them, but I wasn't able to film any of them. But basically every single node is different and they're each five axis milled individually and they're identified with a number. 
um, and they all arrived. So you had 5,500 nodes arrived on site and had to be assembled. The, um, the elements are all straight, they're all prismatic, and these were actually manufactured, they were cut and manufactured by, um, by a robot. So all those elements were manufactured. Um, they were also obviously numbered, so you could find them. I mean, logistically, it's a very complicated process. Here you can see how the nodes are being bolted together. There was a big crash deck underneath here. Interestingly, they didn't use the what we suggested might be a good way to erect this, but of course they know better because they're contractors in terms of the instruction, but they, uh, they built a big crash deck and started from the Oculus and worked their, kind of worked their way out. You can see the glass being installed there. You can see the, uh, the architect doing some quality control on the glass over on the right-hand side. I, I do like to talk about the Oculus because it always comes up, but there's a big ETFE pillow in the middle um, and that lets water in through the, through the, through the side here, as you can see. Um, water is pumped up to create the waterfall and then when it rains, the water also flows, flows through that gap. So these are just images of kind of like the construction process inside and outside, just from our site visits. So you can see, you can see, you know, it was a very, very active and very kind of busy site. And the scale, you can also appreciate kind of the scale of the project here. Um, and it's really, it's really noticeable how there, there isn't really a distinction between the facade um, that is covering the lower levels of the building and the roof. Like there's a very, a very smooth transition so that it's not really readable. And you can see these are, and you can see the building underneath there that has been, that is, uh, that was built before. So yeah, so this is, these are some photographer inspired shots. You can see, we, were, we felt we we're very, very proud of this project. It really actually went extremely well. We had a great, we had a great team. Um, if you're ever in Singapore, make sure you stop by. Um, this is from the opening opening night, which I think we, we probably violated a lot of the uh, Singapore codes on numbers of people. I think they were quite worried because it was such a big event. Um, and I think it's been really happy, very, very successful as a project. The client's extremely happy. Um, it's completely put Singapore um, in terms of its competition with the other airports in the region on the map. Like people, people, we get stuff like this. People saying, "I wish I could be delayed here." And this place is amazing. So anyway, I'm sorry that was quite fast. I speak quite quickly, but I think Carly is going to talk to us about Jewel in context. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Um, how do you want to do this? Do you want to? Oh, you're very this. soft. I can hardly hear you. Now speak maybe, up. Oh, now I can hear you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, would you like me to share my screen and I'll flip through my own slides? Would that work better? Yeah. I think that's okay. better. All right. Um, Does that work? Can you see that okay? Yeah, it looks great. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you, Cristobal. Um, so now I'm gonna just kind of step back in time a little bit and provide some context for the project. Um, and then we're gonna look at a little bit of the, an embodied carbon uh, context as well. So we're gonna start in 1974 with the Mannheim multi-hall. Um, and the reason we started in 1974 is because mainly uh, grid shell projects were made from concrete before this time and around this time, uh, steel construction became more popular. Um, however, Mannheim is a is a timber grid shell, but it's it's a similar process um, to to the steel grid shell. So we'll be talking about that. The next one is in 1989, the Museum of Hamburg, followed by British Museum, Smithsonian, and then the Jewel. Just to provide some some scale for you, uh, this outline in the big oval. Uh, is the jewel, uh, and inside you can fit the British Museum and the Smithsonian, uh, and then there are a few extra projects in there, including King's Crossing and some others. But we'll start with Mannheim. Um, this is the world's largest uh, timber grid shell. It was built in 1974 in Germany. Uh, this is an Obey Arab and Partners project um, in collaboration with Fry Auto. Um, this is uh, the boundaries of this project are actually very interesting. There's not a lot of uh, constraints to the boundaries. So it's, it's um, geometry is flexible that way. Um, however, the geometry is inspired from a hanging chain model for this project. There were 
3D physical hanging chain models done to not only analyze the geometry, but also analyze the structure. Um, this project was mainly inspired by the, uh, by the construction process. Uh, as Chris Ball was saying before, is construction is a main portion in many, many projects we look at, but especially for grid shells as well, to make sure that we can accomplish what we're designing. Um, and this is particularly true for the Mannheim because the way it was constructed, it was, it's a two layer timber grid shell um, and it's laid flat. And then in construction, it's sort of slowly raised into its final form. Um, and so in order to do that, these nodes need to be flexible enough to allow for uh, a certain amount of translation to happen so that they can get into their proper form. Um, so once they're in their proper form, they, the bolts are tightened uh, and then the cladding is laid on top. And the, the cladding is more of a flexible type cladding um, compared to glass and it's a, it's a PVC material. Additionally for this, um, what's unique is that all the, all the members and the nodes are identical. So it's the same, the same uh, section and also the same method for getting the nodes together. The next project is the Museum of Hamburg. Um, this one is in 1989. This is a Schleich Bergman and Partner project. This is a steel grid shell um, and it's different with the boundary conditions because it, this is a courtyard project. So that means is the, the boundaries are pretty set, which, which is in this case an L shape. Um, and so the geometry is inspired by that with two barrel vaults that meet at a, at, at a dome there in the middle. Um, this one again is inspired by construction um, because you know it was used by the museum. They wanted to make sure this could be constructed as fast as possible to get the use back to the museum. Um, and in order to do that, they said, okay, we're gonna have identical um, members and try to get as many nodes to be similar as possible. Um, which is interest is an interesting challenge when you have a dome and you also have barrel vaults because the dome has double curvature, which achieves stiffness through geometry. Uh, but the barrel vault does not have double curvature um, and so it doesn't have the same amount of stiffness. So their solution was to provide this bulkhead, which is pictured here on the right, which are these cables that are provided um, in multiple locations at the barrel vaults to get the extra stiffness in the short direction um, for it. Um, another challenge for this project was the planarity of, of glass. Um, and you can see here they've got quadrangular um, quadrangular uh, meshes, which you know they have four points in each plane. Uh, and as you know, they only need three points to define a plane. So that extra fourth node either has to be on the plane or it's not on the plane. Um, and so for the barrel vault sections, this isn't a problem because you've got a curve that is extruded along another curve. So the planarity is not hard to achieve. But for the dome sections, you have the, have the challenge of trying to get four points to lie on the same plane, uh, which in, hadn't been solved at, at the stage of this project. Um, so actually some of the uh, glass panels in the dome are curved. The next one is the, is the British Museum. Um, th this one is an early 2000s project. This is Burrow Havel and Foster and Partners. Um, this is another steel grid shell. What's interesting about this project is that you've got a, it's a similar uh, challenge where you have a existing structure and you're going to be building on top of this courtyard, trying to cover it. Um, for the British Museum, the, there was a lot of um, a lot of restrictions on the amount of load that could be imposed on the existing buildings, especially the building in the center. Um, and so that proves that proves some challenges for the for the design team when we're looking at what form we're looking to put on top of this. And, and also there are some height restrictions um, from the planning. So what, what this does is that the free form is we want to achieve as much stiffness as we can from, from the geometry of the roof um, without going over these height restrictions. So what that ends up being is we have, um, we do end up having some bending moments in the structure um, trying not to impose too much load on the existing structure. So this, when we have a freeform geometry like, like this one in the British Museum is, um, so this one obviously came before the jewel. And this is a, 
you know, a challenge was how are we going to get these steel members to come together in a seamless way when they may have different depths or they may uh, come at different angles. Um, and when we have all these different uh, nodes and how are we gonna accomplish that? Um, and so through collaboration with the steel fabricator, the six way seamless node CNC milling was able to, um, able to be used. And this was at pretty much at the forefront of the steel fabrication was, was creating these nodes and then their uh, members are welded into place. The, the next project I wanna talk about is the Smithsonian. Um, this one is in Washington, DC. This is another Borough Happold and Foster and Partners project. Um, interestingly enough, it's a similar situation. We have a rectangular courtyard. However, we have eight existing foundations that lie in the middle of this courtyard, not in the middle of the courtyard, but on, on the perimeter of the courtyard. Um, and the client was insistent that these foundations be put to use. So what happens here is we have eight columns that are on top of these eight existing foundations that support this courtyard. So this courtyard doesn't impose any load on the existing structure at all. Um, again, we've got a free form structure. As you can see here in this picture, we have kind of three domes. Uh, there's two smaller domes and there's a bigger one in the middle. And that is due to the locations of the existing foundations. Um, so it's the form kind of followed the, uh, the span, I guess you could say the, the two, the span in the middle is much larger than the ones in, on the side. Um, again, we have we do have some bending due to more height restrictions from the city point of point of view. Um, and this, you know, we have can have a dome that's too tall, and this this has some bending effects in, in the structure itself. So um, we are able to use some of the understanding that we had from tapered members as well. Um, and as Chris well was saying, is we reached this issue. Um, with the with the planarity, we would ideally like to have planar glass um, for economical reasons. Um, so here we have that offset that Christopher was referring to earlier, um, where we're able to have a quadrangular grid, um, but also flat panels as well. Next is the embodied carbon portion. So um, I'll start by saying that it's that none of the projects took into account embodied carbon uh, during the design phase. This, this has been a recent, um, I guess, design influence, relatively speaking. Um, but this, this is an interest that I know Borough Happold has taken in, into understanding the embodied carbon that goes into our structures, uh, what that means and what we can do about it. So this has uh, also been a personal interest to um, assess the embodied carbon and, and why we see certain patterns. Um, so we measure embodied carbon through life cycle assessment, LCA, um, and it's pretty simple. It's we do quantity takeoffs of the building materials and we multiply them by their global warming potential. So that's specific for a type of material, for um, how it's fabricated, how it's brought to site, um, all the energy that gets put into this material and how, and how it gets constructed uh, and put into place. And, through that, we are able to get the whole building global warming potential. Um, we, have a, we have a workflow in-house at Borough Happel at, um, through this BOM LCA toolkit. This is open source information. So this is available for anyone to download, um, to use. Um, this is kind of uh, accessible through Grasshopper and Rhino where we can use the model, the 3D models that we have for our buildings and be able to pretty quickly turn around some uh, embodied carbon results through uh, scripting. For, for grid shells, what we're interested in and accounting for and these for what building materials we wanna look at, um, it's gonna be the nodes that are included, um, of course, the structural elements, and then again, the cladding, um, whether it's the glass or that PVC um, that are gonna be affecting how much embodied carbon goes into the structure. So here you can see the results from, from the study that, that we did. Um, these projects are sorted chronologically. We've got Mannheim on the left and then Changi on the right. Um, what you can see here is that they're, they're made of rings. So the thickness of the ring determines the, uh, 
the global warming potential per plan area. So just so that we're able to compare the projects of different sizes, we've divided their total global warming potential by their area so that we're able to do a proper comparison of the projects. Um, on the left, you see Mannheim's, the, the majority of the embodied carbon comes from the surface cladding, that PVC piping um, compared to the timber members. Uh, the timber is a very low uh, embodied carbon material. So that's that was pretty easy to see coming. Um, the Hamburg Museum has these solid steel members, uh, which take the majority of the embodied carbon uh, and then we see in British Museum, we see that the nodes start taking up a, a, a bigger portion of the embodied carbon. This is the solid steel um, CNC milled uh, nodes that we saw earlier. Um, and, then, and then we look at the Smithsonian and these, the bending in the members caused some pretty deep sections to be required. So we, these members are actually taking up the majority as well. And lastly, with Chingyi, we see that um, the members and, and the surface cladding have almost equal um, uh, percentages of the total embodied carbon. There was a, a lot of glass used in that project. Um, so, but I think the biggest, the biggest thing you can see here, obviously, is that over time, the embodied carbon per area has gone up uh, pretty, pretty drastically, I would say, um, that as we add more complexity, um, we're starting to pack on some embodied carbon. Um, so just some takeaways from this is the, the pattern that we see here is the, is the spatial quality demands um, have increased pretty drastically in these projects. So going from Mannheim, which is an open structure that uh, has no ventilation, it is open to the elements, um, it was meant for temporary purposes, uh, going from that to Chengyi that has um, plants inside that has ventilation requirements, lighting requirements, acoustical requirements, um, that the, the quality of space is, is, is obviously different. And I think that that um, puts higher demands on the design team and what, and, and what solutions we can come up with. Um, and I, I think that, what does this mean for us as structural engineers? I, I think this is a really heavy question um, because we're, our job is to make structurally sound buildings and that's the pri our primary job and, and be responsible to our communities that way. But I think another, another trend that we see coming is how do we be responsible with the materials that we are using? Um, and how do we balance that with what the client demands are? Um, because we're always coming up with what we believe is the best solution to these challenges um, and how do we meet expectations with the client? So what, what's, I think beneficial about these embodied carbon studies is they can be done pretty quickly and very early on in projects and that we can have the, the conversation of this is what we're seeing at early stages of the design process and what can we, what, what can we change and what are we willing to change to, to uh, be more conscious of our environmental impacts um, at stages of design where that can actually be answered. Um, and I guess a, in summary is that we, you know, Throughout these projects, we've solved some key problems, such as the node noting of constructability um, and, and solving that complexity, um, and also looking at the planarity of the panels. We've been able to solve that, um, and I think it's look forward to solving um, some of the, the future goals that we have for these grid shells. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it over to the audience if you guys have any questions, and just thank you very much for your time and, uh, and for showing up today. Thanks, Carly. Uh, this is Dan. Um, I do not see any questions uh, in the tab. I'll give it like a couple minutes here or a couple, couple seconds here. Um, but hey, big thank you to Carly and Cristobal um, from Bureau Apple for this presentation. And honestly, I can't wait to, to get into Singapore airport right now. Um, that's really like a breathtaking kind of project and structure that, that y'all designed. So um, just a couple of things. The presentation was recorded today, so that will be on the uh, CTBUH YouTube channel um, in the next maybe week or so. Um, if anyone wants to get in there and, and reference anything or, or you know, rewatch anything. But um, OK, so we have a question here. What uh, structural analysis software do you typically use? 
Uh, so I can answer that. So we're typically using typically using SAP uh, for these sorts of projects. Um, but we typically like like all big offices, I guess we do typically do check models with other soft other offices do check models of our large of larger projects with other software, so that we avoid kind of like the particularities of um, of specific software packages. Yeah. Hmm. All right, another question here. Can you touch on any acoustical considerations for the jewel facade and any impacts that had on the overall design? So it's interesting you asked that, but that, that it's funny. The, so there's the noise from the airplanes, but actually what the client was really worried about was the noise from the waterfall. Um, the noise actually and the water from the waterfall. So um, yeah, there was a bunch of acoustic studies that were done because um, they were concerned that because um, there's a you, you can't really see it in the or you, I guess you can see it in the cross section. There's a there's kind of a retail mall that's kind of behind the what's called the valley, um, and so they were concerned that it would be really that it might get really noisy or that the space might not be usable. Because the perception is always is that glass is glass you know glass is really reflective of noise, but I think because the glass panel angles keep changing, then it doesn't really it doesn't really focus. And actually, the, the all the trees and the um, the, the green stuff provides like a, a very much a deadening effect of the uh, of all the sound. So it's actually quite quiet up there. It's I mean you can hear the kind of the rumble of the waterfall, but it's actually quite I think it's quite soothing. It's like a really nice white noise. That's fascinating. Um, all right, next question: How do you foresee structural engineers getting involved in reducing embodied carbon at the fabrication stage specifically? Carly, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah. I'm not sure I have an answer to that one. Um, getting involved in reducing embodied carbon at the fabrication stage. Um, I, I think there's there's studies to be done that we, we can do before we send it off to the fabrication. I mean, I think Cristobal touched on that with the with the jewel is how do we um, how are these actually being fabricated and how can we minimize the amount of waste? Yeah. Just being a little bit more interested in the planning of the, um, you know, assisting, assisting the fabricators with um, planning how that's going to, how that's going to happen. And I think part of that is, is the panelization too. I, I, you know, there's cutting when it comes to cladding, um, you know, cladding, cutting of panels, different methodologies that are more wasteful than others. Um, but I think it's just, it needs to be considered in the design stages. I think I don't know, Chris. Well, if you have any, comments? I was just going to say that that's the kind of thing that uh, again, if you have a good, uh, I think you, you, we don't necessarily know this information because we're not fabricators. But I think if you if you give the fabricator a lot of information, like kind of what Carly was talking about, about you know, if you give them the studies that show the pack the packing and and um, you know, you're open to the idea of changing the fabric the way that you fabricate things. That, that would be kind of way a way forward. I mean, we're like. I mean, com completely different material, but like I know that there's all this, uh, you know, there's all this idea about how you make concrete better in terms of lower embodied carbon. So we're definitely interested in incorporating those materials into our specs wherever we can. So I think that I think that you know, as engineers, we have to keep our eyes our, our eyes and ears open about about this topic and about how we how we can be better, right? How we can reduce our the embodied carbon. I think part of it just comes from awareness, right? Like I had no idea before Carly did these studies. I had no idea that cladding was so important. Like if somebody had told me where was all the carbon in the structure, I would have said it's in the steel. And actually, you know, a lot of this is actually in the cladding, which I had I had ne not really realized that. Cool. All right, next question. In recent years, there have been several much smaller grid shells constructed in the US. Do you think the trend will be for more and or larger grid shells in the United States? Carly, what do you think? Do you, think there any large, do you think there are any large grid shells coming? Uh, something, something tells me that there are some potential new grid shells in the U.S. I mean, I think, I think there's actually been, uh, I mean, I live in New York City and the Monaghan station has some great grid shells that were also done by Schleich Bergman. I think that, I think that if there's this idea of, trans, I think the idea of transparency is still, is still out there for, for architects. So I think we will get more grid shells. I think that the, you know, computer fabrication has kind of like um, made these things cheaper, 
but it's also introduced a lot of complexity. So it's a kind of a dangerous tool. But I think that there's a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of possibility. I mean, there's another, I'm just thinking there's another one not very far from where I live. There's a relatively small grid shell on top of a building in Union Square in New York City, which also would never have been fabricated 10 years ago. It's, it's completely related to sort of like the ease with which we're, we seem to be able to accommodate you know, geometrical complexity. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that there will be more of them. All right. So this next question is actually something I was thinking about as well as far as the uh, window washing system. So is there an exterior window washing system for the structure? So that's a really good question. And I actually, I, I didn't talk about that, but like that's another one that we have to be watching out for when we're designing things, right? When you, when you get involved in these projects, you have to end up, you end up hiring somebody who's basically the maintenance consultant mm -hmm. and you have to be actually listen to them because they have to be able to get into the structure to make sure that they're able to wash it. So there's, there's kind of two, two schools of thought, right? Like if you try to, if you try to create machines that clean the exterior, they break and then they don't work and the client gets very angry. Um, but like, how do you deal with the geometrical complexity? Like it's very difficult to make machines that can deal with the geometrical complexity. So a lot of these, Juul itself is, well, it's, I mean, it, it's basically going to be cleaned by abseiling, by abseilers. Mm. So it's, it's not, in that sense, it's not great, right? Because it'd be great to just have a machine that could go up and clean it. But it's a, it's a very difficult problem. Um, the inside is cleaned by cherry pickers. So it's a little bit better. Um, we, we tend to not like abseiling because it's probably, you know, a more dangerous, it's more dangerous for the people doing it. Um, but it, this is a concern, I would, I would say. Mm -hmm. So you know, there, isn't, there isn't one for Changi in particular. Yep. All right, next question. In terms of, it, it, sorry, in terms of embodied carbon, how do grid shells compare with other long span roof systems? Obviously the architectural effect would be quite varied, but if a primary goal was to just roof over a large space. Carly, that's for you. I was hoping I could toss that one. Um, <laughs> no, that's a, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, if the, the prompt is the same, right? Um, is this the most efficient way to span over um, a space? I think, I think one thing is the architectural effect of that, like you mentioned, of transparency, um, interaction with um, the space. Obviously, Jewel, it would be difficult to accomplish the same the same effect with with a different type of structure like like joists or something it wouldn't obviously wouldn't be the same um i think in terms of embodied carbon um i i, I personally haven't looked into that i think it's an excellent question i i think intuition tells me that through you know stiffness of the geometry that there's you know an efficiency that um efficiency there, but I think when it comes to the, the nodal problems that your challenges that you have, uh, that that may be some concern. Um, that's I haven't looked into it though. It's a great question. I, I think I think one of the things about shells is that if you can use them effectively in terms of creating arch arches that basically work in compression, compression is always going to be more efficient than bending in terms of material usage. Um, but you know, it's a very open-ended question. If you could, if you think about like, if you think about a supermarket, right? They're they're making that roof the cheapest way they can with the largest spans, and those are typically, as you know, Carly was talking about joists. They, they're typically done with joists, right? So there's there must be a there's probably a material advantage um, if the spans are relatively reduced to, to just doing it with a with a, sort of a beam type element. I think when you have something very large then I think probably domes take over. So if you think about all those Buckminster Fuller domes, you, you, we kind of understand that that's like the lightest, right? The lightest and hence the, probably the, 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 the solution with the least embodied carbon. I, I do recall from some of the research I was doing with the Smithsonian, I think the, the idea with the Smithsonian was to actually have a flat roof. Um, there, there was no intention to have a double curvature there, but I think the it's really difficult to achieve the lightness of the structure um through through long spans of of beams like through bending like Cristobal was saying so that's the, eventually why they decided to do uh, a roof that had double curvature to to get a lighter 
um, structure. So sometimes I think it's, um, it's okay to say that lightness equals less embodied carbon, but that's not always true um, due to the fabrication of, of, of how it's done. Um, it, that's not always true. So. Okay. Uh, next question here. Did you get specific EPDs for the steel and glass from the fabricators as these were your biggest impacts in A1 through A3? <clears throat> or did you use average values? And did it? And did you look into end of life module D? Uh, we did not look at end of life module D, but we used. Um, we did not get specific EPDs from the glass fabricators. What we did was we used EPDs that were similar for the type of material and the type of uh, fabrication um, for because the like. There's not a lot of information about the fabrication that, that we can get necessarily. So we have to kind of approximate um, what we think, you know, based on the, the machine, that it's a computer controlled, that it's cut how many times, um, is it a rolled, is it, you know, how is it done? So there's not a lot of information. So these were more average values. They weren't specific for the fabricators. Okay. Next question. Uh, during the concept design process, what were the various structural systems considered before finalizing grid shell as the main system and why? So, so I guess where it says concept design, you'd have to write competition, right? So I think that because it was a competition, the Arctic was very much interested in creating kind of a very special space. So I think that that had a lot of, a lot of impact in terms of what sort of structural system was allowed. Like Carly was talking about transparency. I mean, that was really important because we were basically building a greenhouse. Um, and I think that they were really interested in having, it, it probably would have been more efficient maybe, but le probably less clean to have a, a, a double layered system. In other words, to have sort of trust-like elements rather than single elements. But I think in terms of the way it looks and in terms of this kind of the overall, um, design, it made more sense to end up with a, uh, with a grid shell. Um, and I think the shape, the shape, the shape of this, of the, of the project is really coming from the program, right? It's coming from the, the space that they had to work with. And then this, the fact that they had this train running through the middle of it and the fact that they wanted to sort of be able to approach it. The, the, the you, we, I didn't show a context map, but basically there's terminals on all three, on three sides. So it was kind of like the shape itself is also coming from the program. So I think it, it just naturally led to sort of a kind of this kind of donut shape. And I, I mean, they, they very much also wanted to create something in the middle and in the center and this idea of a waterfall. So all these things kind of, they kind of came together um, and created the shape as it is, right? I, I think it's very much a, a creation of the architecture actually. So in that sense, in that sense, it wasn't the, the structural engineer helped to find the best shape but we weren't the sort of the genesis of the, of the show. There wasn't just a simple spanning problem that you might have encountered, um, that you might encounter as a structural engineer. Well, that's great. Yeah, I think you guys, you guys nailed it. Um, that's the last question. I'll give it a second here, but again, thank you to the Bureau Happel team for, for, you know, sharing this presentation. Um, and it just thank you to everyone who attended. Uh, please keep an eye out for more presentations to come um, throughout the year. And um, with that, I'll end the call. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks. That was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. So long.